Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Parsons Technical Webinar Series. I'm your host, Jessica Bennett. We're very excited for today's presentation that will be given by Michael Nahir and Les Cordone on Mining Environmental Management, Parsons Best Practices Applied. Next slide, please. So just a few housekeeping items up front. We'll be keeping all phone lines muted until the Q&A session at the end, just to keep background noise down. Uh, if you have questions throughout the webinar, you can submit them using the chat feature and we'll answer them at the end. You can also hold your questions uh, and ask them live at the end if you prefer. Uh, this webinar has been approved for one PDH credit. If you'd like to receive credit, you can download uh, an attendance form that will be posted in the chat momentarily. Uh, there are four multiple choice questions you'll need to answer on that form, and I'll also post those in case you have any problem downloading the form. Um, please let us know if you have an issue with, uh, with the link to the form that we can provide to you uh, alternatively. Uh, and finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel in the coming days. Uh, next slide. So a brief uh, overview of our presentation today. Uh, I'll introduce our guest speakers, uh, followed by a core value moment, and then we'll get into the technical content, um, addressing several topics, as you can see here, um, for mining. And then we'll wrap up at the end with a Q&A session. Next slide. So Michael Nahir is the director of Parsons Mining Environmental Management Practice. He has over 20 years experience and specializes in mining assessment, planning, costing, and constructability analysis. He's a professional engineer in four provinces, and he recently managed the development of the ISO standard on mine closure and reclamation planning. Uh, Les Cordone is the manager of Parsons Industrial Water and Wastewater Treatment Practice. He has over 35 years experience in process development, design, construction, and operation of wastewater, groundwater, and leachate treatment systems around the world. Um, he's also a professional engineer in the state of New York. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike for the core value of it. Parsons has six core values, and I'll speak to the integrity one here, just so um, to explain a bit more what we mean by that. So in the field of engineering, we learned from the early days at university where in the first year, we watched the classic bridge failure video that makes the statement that lives depend on sound engineering. The engineering associations maintain the ethical standard that engineers must practice. This was recently demonstrated when two engineers lost their license to practice after the Mount Polly failure investigation. Every day we need to remind ourselves that in the face of competing pressures, the integrity of what we do is the most important of all factors that come into engineering design. Mining environmental management is a relatively new field and sound judgment and integrity factors even more into how we practice that profession. So for many mine owners, there is significant financial liability due to environmental issues associated with mine infrastructure. In a number of those cases, there are site features requiring long-term care well after the mine closes, such as water treatment and tailings dam safety. There are two main drivers now in play that suggest that owners need to deal with these liabilities sooner rather than later. First is the recent high profile tailings dams failures that occurred in Canada, Mount Polly I mentioned, and where it led to the loss of life twice in Brazil. The second driver comes from the investment community who want to distance themselves from the exposure of significant environmental risks, as is pointed out in the yearly World Risk Report produced by the International Mining Journal. So now proper environmental management has become a top priority for mine owners. So what is the nature of those risks? The differentiator in mining compared to other types of facilities and contaminated sites is the massive volumes of waste produced. The value of the metals is measured by removing ounces per ton of rock. In many cases, the waste rock will contaminate watercourses, which I'll discuss later. 
Commonly, the process wastes are stored behind tailings dams, which are often located in rerouted creeks and rivers due to topographical and design needs. For long-term closure consideration, high-risk tailings dams need to be built to withstand potential seismic forces and high precipitation events to not fail. And these variables change over time as climate changes, meaning the service life of tailings dams need to be indefinite. Nearby communities do not want the extensive disturbance to their surrounding lands coming from the storage of these mine wastes. Visual impacts can also be in the thousands of acres. As a result, proper environmental management is often high in capital and operating costs. Well thought out programs will reduce the impact of both. An example of such a challenge is at the Faro Mine in the Yukon Territory in Canada, which I'll speak to later as a case study. It is a large mine built and managed in the standard of the 80s, which was a major producer of lead and zinc. The mine's design was suitable for production, but not built for closure. And now many upgrades are needed to all the mine infrastructure, including upgrading the geotechnical stability of the tailings dams, resizing the clean water diversions to meet the seismic and hydraulic standards, and covering the tailings and waste rock to reduce the tremendous contamination potential into water courses. Mine water management is the main focus of the care and maintenance program will be required well into the future. The mined out pit walls at the site are physically and geochemically unstable. Combined with the waste rock, the tailings areas take up an extensive part of the land area and valleys. Overall, about 25 square kilometers or around 6,000 acres is the total land disturbance. So recently, there's been some effort to provide guidance on the management of mining environmental liabilities for industry and governments. The International Council on Mining and Metals, which is a mining industry association, has generated a number of useful guidelines and tools to support proper closure, including best practices and stakeholder engagement and social closure. The International Standards Organization has just completed the standard for mine closure and reclamation planning, along with an accompanying technical guidance manual to support the standard. The International Committee on Large Dams, ICOLD, and the Canadian Dam Association, CDA, are excellent tools for designing and managing dam safety requirements and are often internationally recognized and practiced standards. They provide hydraulic and seismic design guidelines based on risk to population, the environment, and critical infrastructure. Based on some of the recent mining disasters, major investors have indicated that the mining industry needs to improve in several areas including ESG, environment, social and governance, policy and practice. Investors such as the Church of England have given the sector until 2030 to meet their agenda. The Global Industry Standard on Tailings Management developed by the ICMM strives to achieve the ultimate goal of zero harm to people and the environment with zero tolerance for human fatality. It requires operators to take the responsibility and to prioritize the safety of tailings facilities through all phases of the facility's life cycle including the closure, post-closure phases. It also requires the disclosure of important information to address public accountability. A few more words about the ISO standard. The key objectives of the ISO standard on mine closure and reclamation planning and supporting guidance is to first provide one document that encapsulates best practices across the many disciplines associated with mine closure. As many of these practices are scattered in various jurisdictions, and second priority is that the international standard be developed by all interested stakeholders, including industry, government, civil society, aboriginals, and academia. The underlying principles include, first, assigning appropriate responsibilities to management professionals. Two, that closure is an integral part of the mining life cycle and, that, and thus closure design needs to be factored into the initial and subsequent stages of mine plans. Three is that the robust design, robust design is required to account for uncertainty given the long design life requirements of the mine structures. Four is that the continual management of risk and opportunities occur to lower ability during, uh, sorry, lower liability during operations as areas are put out of service. Five, that the continual improvement occurs by the use of adaptive management practices 
as technology and thinking evolves in mine waste management. And finally, that knowledge management and transparency are critical to maintain, uh, of important records are critical to earn and maintain public trust. So now I want to dive into some of the key technical considerations of mining environmental management. Common closure objectives that are set for the project lead to the development of site-specific closure criteria for mediating physical and chemical stability, as well as designing post-mining land use. These objectives typically involve such concepts as that the public should be safe from physical hazards on site during, including dams, slopes, mine openings and other infrastructure. They also involve the protection of the environment, particularly from impacts to surface water on site and in downstream receiving environment, as well as on land from eroding surfaces or wind blown tailings. More recently, the expectation is that the mine has closed, the disturbed land should, and that the disturbed land should be in a form which permits future uses such as wildlife farming, parks, recreational facilities, or industrial development. The formation and buy-in of these objectives need to be done with stakeholders and rights holders at the earliest stages of mine site planning to have success. Working with surrounding communities at the early stages of the mine develops trust and a sense of partnership that is today critical to the success of the project. Failure to do this right risks the projects at later stages and can be very costly. In terms of the main physical risks at developed sites, tailings ponds are structurally the most significant risk. Many were built before real design standards were developed or were built with mining operation design life as compared to a closure design life. Design considerations include meeting seismic stability criteria to meet a more robust design requirement. Damp spillways need to be designed to pass anticipated maximum predicted flows depending on the risk. Clean water diversions need to be designed to pass those same flows. This reduces the risk of failure downstream systems and will lower treatment costs. Often these are undersized and present a massive cost risk if rebuilding is needed to meet long-term closure needs. The stability of underground working stopes, added shafts and portals and pit walls are significant safety and land use concern. As an example of the giant mine, which I'll showcase later, Many of the underground workings required engineered backfill to mitigate against undersized crown pillars, which is that rock between the top of the mined out stope and ground surface or other mined out stopes. This is a costly endeavor and avoidable. Many dams have and some continue to be built upstream on tailings due to lower construction costs as production increases. The standard on this has changed in favor of more stable and robust design approaches such as center line or downstream construction construction lifts. This can be a major cost cost item if upgrading is needed. To lower the risk of dam failure, construction modifications are needed to increase geotechnical stability. Often a change in operational procedures is needed to lower the groundwater level in the tailings pond and coupled with increased stability monitoring, the risk of dam failure can be reduced. We also need to consider designing to account for extreme events such as floods, earthquakes, as well as perpetual disruptive forces such as erosion, water infiltration that mine waste structures are subjected to. One of the big questions that always comes up when thinking about engineering issues is design life. Do you invest heavy in capex to design against all sorts of high consequence, low probability events? Or do you take the approach of a lower capex with a higher opex and hope that the OPEX reduces over time as technology improves. In some cases, the answer is already provided by jurisdictions as they standardize these design requirements. But in many jurisdictions, this is left up to the owners of financial decision, provided that they can meet the environmental regulations. Due to the durability of engineered structures and strengths of materials, it's hard to conceive of designs that last more than, than a period of say 100 years. Certainly when you think about what we knew 100 years ago and the state of technology then, Engineers and scientists do use projections, for example, based on estimates of precipitation return periods to be able to design for reasonably long periods, say to thousand year 
return periods, or even maximum precipitation events, which are arrived at by extrapolating from what we know has occurred. There's obvious uncertainty in this approach that is based on predictions. However, it is based on current science and the quality of the data. So adaptive management is essential for design life concerns. For long-term waste management containment, which exists in a number of industries, including landfills and nuclear waste, we need to make sure that we have systems whereby owners can learn and adapt as time goes on. To look at chemical concerns related to mine closure, you must look at process waste streams and environmental processes that impact valuable water resources. Process contaminants of concern include often cyanides used for metal leaching and mercury from old mines that were part of the processing at that time. Acidification is common in pyritic host rock when crushed into fine particles and then exposed to oxygen and water. This is one of the most significant long-term environmental and cost issues in mining. You can have this problem during operations, closure, and even post-closure. This condition can be a sleeper when the acid potential uses up the neutralizing potential only in many years to come. This creates a major challenge and liability into the future. There are various tests that are available to determine for this potential and can be used as a basis for design decisions, such as waste cover thickness, as well as when developing source terms or input parameters for mine water treatment when required. So the holy grail in mining environmental management is to avoid long-term water treatment by getting ahead of it if possible and reducing the requirements for it. There are different processes to control reactions depending on where you are in the mine life. Earlier, of course, the better to control the reactions. Covers are used to limit oxygen or water. More often, however, cover slow reactions down to reduce impacts to toler tolerable levels. Clean water diversions can be used to eliminate or reduce contact with contaminants. And if ultimately you lose the battle against shutting these reactions down, you'll need to treat surface and groundwater until these reactions have been exhausted. Where possible, the use of wetlands is an excellent way to reduce cost by using natural systems of metals adsorption. A very challenging part of mine closure is how to manage public expectations of the post mining land use, as there will be limitations. This is also the part of the closure work that the stakeholders see and feel that they can control, so it tends to attract a lot of attention. There are limitations to what you can do with large open pits, tailings, heap leach piles, and waste rock piles. There are creative ideas for large open pits, such as turning them into lakes or landfills, for example. There is a book called 101 Things to Do with an Open Pit. Tailings have been reprocessed and with more advanced technologies to extract precious commodities, but still need to be managed and closed. Tailings have been used for road construction. For some mines close to communities, the tailing storage facilities have been turned into flat sports surfaces for soccer and football fields and other types of sports. The best case is when you can get the community involved in the design and have them maintain the site for recreational purposes. This supports community buy-in and helps maintain the facility. Another important consideration is to have the design of the surface of the waste piles match the topography of the surrounding landforms. This supports natural drainage and vegetation, which then requires much less maintenance. This shows the cost challenges of how mines are closed today. If you look at uncertainty of the closure of liability over time, over the mine life cycle, you'd conclude that the cost control related to the closure program will be a major concern as there is quite a bit of uncertainty in the financial liability. Certainty improves towards the end of life of the mine as final plans evolve. Uncertainty can then be greatly reduced by having advanced closure designs early in the project life cycle. Also, liabilities can be reduced during operations by closing off areas that are no longer operational but still show up in the books as requiring closure. So at Parsons, our approach is to, to reducing the high cost of liability associated with mining environmental management by embedding the mine closure planning and engineering into the site operations and construction remediation works. Careful planning at the various stages of the design life will save our clients lots of money. In developing the environmental management plan, 
Our steps are to conduct a proper site assessment and developing the conceptual site model early to understand where the issues that drive the project. The challenge is to avoid turning every aspect of the assessment into a science experiment. Preliminary options are developed and the assessment programs used to answer those questions for those options. A short list of feasible options are then finalized. Then going through the options analysis backed up by a multiple accounts analysis allows us to compare the performance of those options against credible objectives and criteria. This can only be done with good quality cost estimates to ensure that the selected option is affordable, requiring otherwise a relook at the objectives or having to conduct more assessment. Looking at different failure modes will improve design for robustness and constructability assessments will ensure that you can build the project as planned and expose hidden costs that are better to know ahead of the construction work. Developing a well thought through adaptive management plan that will work through a process of addressing concerns in a systematic way will save from over designing the project for risks that may never appear and thereby avoid unnecessary costs. Project management is key to the success of the project. All site operations and construction activities require careful planning to ensure safety and efficiency. Parsons excels at delivering mine site projects and construction management. To obtain best value for owners, Parsons provides a procurement for each package and manages all the operations and construction works to have complete schedule and cost control. We interface with regulators and the community to obtain the work authorization and buy-in from stakeholders. Our track record on delivering on socioeconomic objectives is second to none. So now I'll just speak to a few case studies here. Um, I've been involved in environmental aspects of mining for nearly 30 years, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to pursue interesting work in, in the Arctic among other locations uh, worldwide. In 2012, uh, Parsons identified an increase in environmental activity at mines located in Northern Canada. Many of these mines are the responsibility of the federal government who after years of assessment had decided to start to undertake risk reduction projects under urgent work programs. This would be followed by the full remediation of many of their abandoned mines. Today, I wanna to share some information about some of the issues at the giant ferro sites that are common at many of the other sites worldwide. So the former uh, giant gold mine is in the city of Yellowknife Northwest Territories in Canada. It got its name in the summer of 1935 when two prospectors staked 21 giant claims. By 1937, giant Yellowknife gold mines was created. The company fell in hard times and by 1940 had halted due to uh, halted construction due to World War II. However, after the war, production resumed and the first gold brick was poured June 3rd, 1948. The mine operated until 1998 and produced over 7 million ounces of gold. Since 1998, the site has been under care maintenance program administered by the Federal Government of Canada. Full, remed full remediation starts this April, 2023 with the construction of the permanent water treatment plant. Parsons has been active at the site since 2013. So the bedrock in the Yellowknife area, including Giant Mine, contains arsenal pyrite. This is a naturally occurring mineral composed of iron, sulfur, and arsenic. Arsenic, arsenic trioxide was created during mining operations. When the ore was roasted to release the gold, arsenic was also released as a gas. As the gas cooled, it changed into solid state and became toxic arsenic trioxide dust. The arsenic trioxide dust was initially released to the environment as shown in this undated photo. Eventually, this waste was collected and stored in 14 underground chambers and stopes. From a Parsons perspective, the first of these projects we won was the deconstruction of the roaster complex at the giant mine in Yellowknife. Then in 2015, we won the role of interim construction manager at Giant Mine and <clears throat> carried out a variety of urgent work projects. In 2016, we were awarded a contract to manage the care and maintenance of the Faro Mine um, in, in Faro Yukon. 
Then in 2017, we won the giant mine, giant main construction manager contract, which includes the reclamation of the mine site over the next 15 years. And most recently, we won the uh, con main construction manager project for giant, uh, which is expected to last approximately 15 years uh, into you know, 2032 and beyond, perhaps. In 2013, 14, and 15, Parsons decontaminated and deconstructed the roaster complex. The work was very difficult as the arsenic was impregnated in all parts of the building and needed to be re removed in many areas by hand. The work was done under negative pressure for the safety of workers who wore full protective equipment. The work was slow and tedious, but was completed on time and on budget. This activity produced more than 10,000 cubic meters of arsenic and asbestos waste that is presently located in storage containers on site and awaiting final disposal as part of the main site remediation. There are 10 chambers uh, built for the purpose of storing the arsenic trioxide waste and five mined out stopes that were subsequently used to contain uh, the, the, full, the full total of uh, 237,000 tons of arsenic trioxide waste. The waste is in dust, as mentioned, and is highly soluble. The chambers and stopes are surrounded by solid competent rock between 80 and 250 feet below grade. The model in one of the photos compares the size of one of the stopes to Yellowknife's largest buildings. The plan is to take advantage of the subarctic climate and freeze the arsenic in place using thermosiphons. There was substantial bench scale and pilot testing to confirm the feasibility of this approach, and thermo models were generated to design the full scale program. The models were also validated against climate change predictions. So aside from the arsenic trioxide, there's four tailings ponds containing 16 million tons of arsenic contaminated tailings. The buildings and surface areas are contaminated with arsenic and asbestos. There's an annual accumulation and treatment of approximately 130 million gallons of arsenic contaminated mine water. There is over 1 million cubic meters of contaminated soil. And the site also has eight pits and 35 openings to the underground. Over the last five years, we have completed several key urgent works projects. So that includes the roaster complex deconstruction, two shaft and head frame uh, demolitions, pit buttress or pit wall stability, water treatment plant improvements, underground communications, and then underground backfill of high risk areas. We're presently planning the implementation of the remediation plan to begin in early 2023. The project implementation plan and construction estimates were prepared for funding approval. The plan lays out the whole project schedule, including sequencing, procurement approach, socioeconomic plan, among other aspects of project. So I'm going to move on to the ferromine. The ferromine The remediation project is being established to prevent the contamination of nearby land and water from the former mining operation. Currently, a preliminary design for the remediation is completed and the project is in regulatory approval stage. Number of urgent works have been completed to keep the site safe and in compliance. The Faro Mine is located on the traditional land of the Casca First Nations in the Yukon in Northern Canada and is approximately 2,500 kilometers from major population and supply centers. The climate is also subarctic with long, cold, dark winters and cool summers that feature 20 hours of daylight. Most of the surface water is frozen from October to April. The Yukon features large distances and small populations, which can, which can make it difficult to find staff and to subcontract the work. Transportation and logistics are major cost factors. The Faro Mine was once the world's largest open pit lead zinc mine, located in an area referred to by the Casca people as 
the Mountain of Plenty, which referred to the abundant wildlife in the area. It was discovered in the mid 50s and constructed by Parsons in the 60s and operated until 1998 when it too went into receivership. It has been in care and maintenance and remediation and closure planning since. Some of the prominent features in the photo include the four kilometer long tailings basin and the clean water diversion to the on the right side. The large blue pond in the foreground is the polishing pond used to store water before discharge to the environment. As mentioned, the mine was abandoned in 1998 and is currently in care and maintenance, which is self-performed by Parsons. This work includes monitoring the environmental quality, managing the clean water diversions, collecting and treating contaminated water, ensuring that the water leaving the site meets the environmental standards, maintaining site infrastructure, including roads, buildings, dams, dikes, and stream channels. In 2018, Parsons began construction of the urgent works projects. Shortly, we'll begin the planning stage of the main remediation project, including development of the project implementation plan, which lays out the schedule on how the work will be done over the expected 15 years of the project construction works. Today, as the site is very complex, risk mitigation works is taking place at the site to ensure it remains stable and in compliance. This work is happening necessarily ahead of the regulatory approvals for the full site remediation closure of the site. There's massive, massive uh, acid rock drainage being generated in both the tailings ponds and waste rock piles. There are numerous contaminated seeps that require collection and treatment. The clean water diversions are undersized for closure. The pits of contaminated water and the pit walls are geotechnically unstable in locations. The site has old infrastructure and numerous buildings that require demolition and disposal. Ongoing environmental monitoring ensures that the systems are working as designed and that the site remains compliant with environmental health and safety regulations. The highest priority issues are being addressed while the Faro Mine Remediation and Closure Project proposals proceeds through regulatory and funding approvals. The polishing pond water was blue, as in that last photo, for decades until 2016 and is red brown today demonstrating how the site water quality is under constant threat as acid rock drainage takes hold of the site. Water that could be discharged to the environment four years ago must now be treated. A further indication of changes in the area, in the area is in the foreground of the polishing pond known as X13, which is a compliance point. In May 2019, upwelling impacted water from tailings base from the tailings basin had resulted in degradation of the compliance point X13, as mentioned. Water quality and capture conveyance systems had been designed, constructed, and placed into operation. So now water from the X13 area is pumped in the tailings basin and then to the ferro pit for eventual treatment. This project included installing a 1500 horsepower pump and seven kilometers of insulated HDP pipe. The Fairmine complex itself features three open pits. The Van Gorda pit is the site of the original discovery and presently contains some of the poorest quality water on site. The Grum pit features a slightly impacted water that is pumped over to Van Gorda pit and then treated uh, and, and discharged to the environment. The Ferro pit, which is the largest pit and contains moderately impacted water, which must be treated as well before discharge. The water uh, pit is approximately 100 meters deep and contains a mixture of ground and surface water recovered from elsewhere on the site. It is the main storage of contaminated water and is fundamental to the water management system used to keep the site in compliance. One of the main challenges in doing the care and maintenance of the site is the water management system, as I met, just described. General water movements in the Faro mine area are comprised of clean water and impacted water. The impacted water shown in green is associated with all mining features, including the pit, the tailings, and the waste rock. Most of the water is collected as surface water, but groundwater is collected in certain areas as well. 
clean water shown in blue is diverted around the mine. The water is collected and conveyed to the ferro pit where it is stored for treatment and direct discharge to the environment. Water has to be treated seasonally and accommodation for spring melt in the various storage areas has to be planned for next year's accumulation. There are three active water treatment plants on site. The main system is the interim water treatment plant. It was constructed in 2014, which has a capacity of 6,000 gallons per minute, which is 1.43 billion gallons annually. It operates seasonally from April to November. There's the Van Gorda water treatment plant, which I mentioned, located by the two other pits. It was constructed in 1992 and has the capacity of 2,000 gallons per minute, which equals 460 million gall gallons annually. And it also operates from May to September. Finally, the Cross Valley Pond treatment plant, which is located at the bottom of the tailings area, is a capacity of 2,000 gallons per minute. Capacity is also seasonally operated. And Les Cordon will speak to that more shortly. Due to regulatory exceedances, one of the urgent works was to realign and isolate the North Fork of Rose Creek. In order to prevent the creek from coming into contact with contaminated water on the site and as such keep clean water clean. The North Fork of Rose Creek is a major input of clean water to the site. The project first started with constructing a temporary diversion channel to convey the existing channel while the permanent diversion channel is being constructed. The new diversion channel is engineered and constructed with liners to avoid contamination from the surrounding contaminated seeps. It is also designed to pass the 200 year flows plus a freeboard allowance of about one foot. As part of the work, 180 foot high former haul road was excavated and removed to allow the realigned creek to flow freely and fish to migrate. This was a two year project completed in 2021. Next month's Parsons technical webinar will be focused on just this project specifically. So, Faro has a population of 344 people. Many of them work for Parsons. We have a seasonal on site workforce that reaches 50 staff. I want to recognize the many local people who make our work happen from management various trades, operators, the tax, environmental tax, chemists, security, and emergency responders. I'm going to now turn over the presentation to Les Cordon, who will discuss the design of the water treatment plant presently under construction at Faro. Thanks, Michael. Uh, for mine reclamation water treatment, uh, before I get into this specific case study, uh, I just wanted to mention that there's a broad range of physical, primarily physical chemical treatment methods that are used. Everything from oxidation, standard conventional precipitation, coagulation, uh, gravity settling, filtration, but then also advanced technologies depending on the quality of water required, including things like microfiltration, membrane processes, ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, ion exchange. So we get the full gamut of uh, treatment technologies potentially applicable. Uh, in order to may, uh, stay with the, stay consistent with the theme of the, of the presentation here, I'm gonna briefly discuss the work that we're doing right now at the Cross Valley Pond uh, at Faro because we have a treatment system there that we, that we uh, uh, constructed and is in, currently in operation really for the first full season this season right now. So what was the problem? Michael showed you the photo of the, the CVP, which is uh, here. Uh, and what, what you see there is it had, it had inverted and basically flipped. And you, what, that orange color you see is a lot of iron. There's a lot of iron in the water, anywhere from 40 to say 400 milligrams per liter. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the requirement for treatment on the effluent side for that, for that water was really uh, dictated by zinc at the time. Uh, but the other issue that we had was whole effluent toxicity. The uh, Rose Creek uh, that that the water is that uh, that is diverted around the area and and also flows uh, away from the uh, from the uh, the site is a is a high quality water. There's grayling and there's trout in that stream. Very nice stream. Uh, and so there is a whole effluent toxicity requirement, and it's it's uh, it's for uh, uh, rainbow trout. And and there were whole effluent toxicity issues, and we started to look at that before we 
uh, put this treatment system together, and we kind of did a toxicity reduction evaluation and determined that iron really was potentially the issue uh, for the whole effluent toxicity. So we're going after iron in this treatment system, uh, as well as zinc and some manganese. Um, the reason why we looked at iron was because it, it goes back to work that had been done years ago in the Adirondack Mountains when the acid precipitation was causing cycling up of aluminum. Uh, it was shown that the high, the high pH environment in young fish fry causes precipitation on their gill structure. And that micrograph photo that you see down below there uh, is actually a photo of iron precipitating on on uh, young fish fry gills. And so that we speculated that's what was causing the issue. And we did some controlled testing, some controlled jar testing uh, before we specified this treatment system and actually determined that, yeah, that, that was the issue for toxicity. And so we moved forward with a, with a conventional treatment plant uh, to treat this water using coagulation, flocculation, we, and uh, precipitation and filtration. This is a very basic process flow diagram that shows the treatment process. The water comes in, we pump it out of the pond, we oxidize it with, with oxygen. We don't add any other oxidant but air. And then we add lime, get the pH up where we want it. The next, the next tank, we are flocculating it under low mixing conditions uh, and adding polymer. And then it goes through some very efficient uh, inclined plate clarifiers. And then it's filtered through a multimedia filter and it can be discharged at that point. And to show you a photo of the system, sorry, the system right now, uh, the scheduling on this, we designed it and well, we designed it in 2018, 2019 timeframe. Uh, it was constructed during the 2020, 2021 construction season, and we began to commission it last year. But this, but this season, we started it up again, uh, and it's in full operation now. Uh, Michael and I are actually with a client this week, and we're, we're getting good news that the, uh, the treatment system is working very well. Non-detect concentrations of zinc. And, and other constituents that are regulated in the effluent. And uh, let me just show you from the, from the PFD that I showed, this was during construction, okay? We were setting this equipment down that we actually, uh, it's a sustainability issue. We we're able to use this equipment from another site that we were working on in the States and bring it up to, up to Faro. We, we set this treatment plan up on rig mats. These are drilling rig mats. And you can see the two trains here. These are the influent oxidation tanks. These are the, the, the flocculation tanks, and these are the inclined plate clarifiers, and then the filters are down here. And from an end view, you're looking at it here as it's currently installed and operating. And the discharge goes right over here and goes right out into Rose Creek. Uh, so that's the treatment system currently in operation, and we have good news. We are uh, uh, in the operation for this season, which is really the first full season of operation. And the team is able to treat over 2,000 gallons a minute, which is actually in excess of the, the design. The design was we could get 1,000 GPM through each train, and we're able to do more than that. And it's really helping with the water management on the site, because as you can see from Michael's discussion, it's a really a game of water balance here. We cannot let any impacted water leave the site. So we need to pump it around or treat it and discharge it. And that's what we're doing. Michael. So uh, thanks, Les. So just you know, in conclusion, this is my last slide here. Um, mining environmental management is a, is a complex multidisciplinary effort requiring an investment into planning and execution. Uh, there are key strategic inputs required in the mining life cycle to reduce operational closure liability. We described the common site that described typical site risks and Parsons approach to managing those those risks and providing best value to owners. So with that, uh, I just want to thank you for your attention and open um, open the discussion for questions. Thanks, Mike and Les. Uh, it was really a great presentation on uh, all the challenges and considerations when it comes to mining and, and how you can you know, incorporate that uh, for best practices. Um, if there's any questions, you can raise your hand um, using the, the raise your hand feature, or you can put your question into the chat and we'll read it out. Um, I posted the PDH credit form link uh, and I'll, uh, for anyone who didn't get it previously.
Uh, I see Laurel May. Um, you can unmute yourself and please ask your question. Yeah. Hi guys. Great presentation. Um, so I hopped on a little bit late. Um, but Michael, I heard you mention um that one of the models you guys were working on um considered climate change factors, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um like what you considered and uh, how you did that. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Um. Yeah, so that was related to the um, thermosiphon installation at um, at Giant Mine, which is the design for that is to be used for um, stabilizing the waste in, in those chambers, and the thermosiphons will be used to provide basically a freeze uh, bubble around the site, and it actually freezes well into the waste as well over time. Uh, so. The thermal models and, and the thermal siphons themselves are a passive system whereby they essentially cool. They, they drive the, the coolness from the air into the ground and then uh, shut off in the summer so to not uh, create any further convection and conduction heat transfer type issues. So, uh, but in the model, we used um, uh, not just ambient and you know, current ambient conditions in Yellowknife, but also looked at uh, the IPCC um, numbers that, you know, were used to inform the model too. So we ran the models to make sure that the freeze program would advance and keep stable uh, throughout that, um, throughout the, you know, throughout time. Uh, and that um, we, you know, that the, the mine waste would would maintain itself in, in a contained situation. Right. OK, thank you. Uh, if there's any more questions, you can uh, again enter it in the chat feature and we'll read it out or you can raise your hands. So about uh, 10 minutes left uh, before the webinar wraps up. Well, Mike and Les, I guess you guys uh, gave such a great presentation that uh, there are no questions. You answered everything. Uh, actually, I see Stephen uh, O'Connor. Yeah, uh, Stephen O'Connor, if you want to unmute yourself. Hello there. Yeah, Stephen O'Connor here, listening in in Saudi Arabia. Um, very, very interesting stuff. A slightly different environment out here, of course. But I just had one quick question to both of you, really, Les and Michael. Do you know if we do any of this kind of work um, in operational mines and not just disuse mines? In, in other words, I'm thinking if we could do all this again, um, would we would we not do it as we went rather than wait till you know 50 years down the line and when the mine closes and 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 so on? I was just wondering if if we do that kind of work as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it's a great question. The yeah, I mean, those two projects were, you know, abandoned mines that the damage was done. Um, and part of my presentation, the early parts was uh, dedicated to, you know, um, how to prevent all that as much as, or not all of it, but as much of it as possible by planning well ahead, right? So certainly, you know, I mean, they, they say planning for closure. So in other words, when you design the mine, to start with, you plan on how it's going to be closed. So in other words, you build to not just operational standards, but to closure and permanent closure standards, which obviously requires a, a bigger investment up front, but is usually much cheaper than um, dealing with it later. Um, as as you could see, that that would be the case for what happened at Giant Pharaoh. But you know, so we're doing some work uh, on you know, heat bleach facilities and other designs that, um, and, and tailings dams that allow us to, you know, get ahead of, of the issues. Not to say that it go, it all goes away, but that it's a lot cheaper and better value to to get get ahead of it. And, and that's reflected in those, some of the standards that I mentioned, the ISO standard and the ICMM standards that, you know, they all say plan for closure, 
up front, do the thinking up front. Don't just uh, deal with it right at the end because then a lot of those choices have been made for you and it's too late. So I, anyway, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, yeah, thanks. Um, I see we have a question in the chat from Ron Krawcheck. Um, How often do the closure plans require revisiting? Great question. Um, so different jurisdictions have different um, different requirements in that area, but the rule of thumb is anytime there's a process change in the mine itself, that that would then um, invoke or start a, or necessitate, let's say, um, re a relook at the closure uh, plan and to make sure that the new operation or the new uh, part of the, of, of the mine complex that's being built uh, or any modifications thereof would would be uh, they also there's also um, sort of a general uh, thought that every five years if there is no process change so if a process change happens three years in then uh, that would um, then bring on a relook a revisit of the closure plan um, or five years, whichever comes first sort of thing. Great, thanks Mike. Uh, I see Christy Diller, um, you have your hand raised if you want to ask your question. Yeah, thanks. Um, great presentation, Mike and Les. Um, Mike, you talked about um, the high volumes of tailings and waste rock that are generated during mining. Um, what is typically done for the closure of those? You know, like, is, are they just covered? And if so, what types of covers do you use? Yeah, um, so in sort of cu customarily, and it really depends on, on a lot of questions, a lot of um, the environmental conditions. So for example, in a net precipitative environment, you, you might consider water covers, though there's tailings dams issues associated with that. Um, because otherwise you have to maintain the water off the site unless you can d uh, design covers that shed water well. Um, and they also have, you know, what they call store and release covers, which means it absorbs water and then it's thick enough to then have evapotranspiration or or water uh, drainage off, off the covers. Uh, if you're in more arid climates where there's, you know, net evaporative environment, then uh, Typically, you would be able to get away with uh, sort of earthen covers, um, and you might not need the liners that you would for net precipitative environments where we're really keeping water off the off the tailings ponds and off the tailings. Um, you know, would, would be would be pretty important. So, I mean, there's and there's a variety of different covers. Uh, you know, there's just physical barrier covers. There's uh, precipitation covers, there's oxygen covers, uh, I mentioned um, storm release. So there, there's a fair bit of technology on that now. Um, and and there's there's some interesting developments in covers there. Often there's like standards that are designed to reduce infiltration to, you know, numbers to 10 to the minus nine meters per second. But in reality, over time, those tend to break down and you don't often meet those original standards so and they're learning that over time because they're doing they're doing you know environmental investigations of what actually precipitation you know that's getting through to the tailings you know what what types of uh, impacts those occur or occur from that so um but anyway there's there's uh you know there's there's a lot behind mine tailings covers uh which is common for both tailings and waste rock depending on on the geochemistry of of both of those so um just a long-winded answer but there's a there's a lot to that yeah it sounds like you could give a whole webinar just about that <laughs> probably <laughs> <laughs> thanks all right i think uh if there's no more questions we can go to the next slide And so I think there's a lag on my end, but I'm assuming everybody else can see it by now. Um, so next month's webinar uh, will be September 14th at 1230 Eastern. Uh, be presented by uh, Karen Levin and Eric Domingue. 
uh, on acid rock drainage diversion case study, uh, which an environmental and water quality success story. Um, so we hope you can join us next month.